Hello, I am Marco Davis, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Thank you for being with us here at our 2020 Health Summit. This next session will focus on the Affordable Care Act and its implications for the Latino community, and it features three distinguished members of Congress. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, Latinos experience large gains in coverage under the Affordable Care Act, reducing disparities in health care coverage. But the future of the ACA is uncertain, so there's more work to do when it comes to providing our community with access to health care resources and preventive care for our children and families. Before we begin, I want to extend my thanks to our sponsors, Gilead and the National Minority Quality Forum for their generous support of CHCI and this health summit. I also want to remind you that you can follow the live stream of this session on Facebook at CHCI DC and be sure to post on social media platforms using the hashtag CHCI Summit. And now I want to welcome our session moderator, my dear friend Maria Cardona. Maria is head and founder of Dewey Square Group's public affairs practice Latinovations and a regular commentator on CNN. But earlier this year, she launched and now hosts her own talk show called Maria that airs on the El Rey Network. Enjoy the session. Maria. Gracias, Marco Davis, for that incredible introduction. Thank you so much, CHCI, for giving me the honor of moderating this really important panel, uh, an incredibly important conversation, and at such a pivotal time in our country. For everyone who is watching, Please use hashtag CHCI Summit. Let us know what you're thinking. Uh, use your social media to get the word out about these really important conversations that we are having. And this next panel really is critical. We are facing a global pandemic that has ravaged the country and has ravaged minority communities disproportionately. We are about to come on to the number of 240,000 American deaths from this pandemic and a current president of the United States who has been unable and unwilling to crush it by putting together a national plan to confront it. We are now at a point where we have a president-elect and a vice president-elect who have made this a priority. It's one of the reasons why they got elected. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Congressman Raul Ruiz, what Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and what Congressman Ami Bera have to say about the Affordable Care Act, about minority communities and Latinos, and the impact that the ACA can have if the Supreme Court takes it away, and how do we move forward to ensure that a majority of Latinos, a majority of minorities in this country, and frankly, a majority of Americans have access to affordable quality health care. So with that, I'd love to introduce Congressman Raul Ruiz from California for his opening remarks. Oh, well, thank you so much, Maria, for, uh, for moderating this very, very important conversation. Look, I'm uh, Congressman Raul Ruiz. I'm an emergency physician, public health expert in California's 36th Congressional District, home of the Coachella Festival and other music festivals. I think a lot of people would recognize it that way. Um, and uh, I've made it a life mission to focus on health care, health equity, and, and social justice issues. Primarily because I grew up here in Coachella in a farm worker trailer park with farm worker parents and my older brother and I were the first to graduate from high school in our family and I went to college and medical school and all that and came back home to serve and so it's been a life mission as a physician and now as a congress member. We're in the middle of a pandemic that in a system that has failed many communities and that is why you're seeing the uh, pandemic uh, ravage African American communities, Latino communities, rural communities, Native American communities, because this system, this failed system, has produced these healthcare disparities and barriers to access to care. And the Affordable Care Act was a method to help remedy that. You have uh, increase in millions of people having uh, health insurance for the first time. You have coverage for essential health benefits. You have protections for pe people with pre-existing conditions, precisely the ones that render people uh, more at risk of dying from COVID-19. 
precisely the ones that once you get COVID-19, there's a sequela of chronic illness, possibly especially pulmonary illnesses that can render one uh, having chronic illnesses. So at this moment, the Trump administration, the Republicans are trying to uh, repeal the entirety of the Affordable Care Act through the Supreme Court uh, uh, case. And that would be devastating for these communities that are already carrying the burden of death uh, and morbidity through the COVID-19. So for example, it would mean that essential health benefits would be wiped away so that these insurance companies didn't have to have to offer uh, insurance for certain things like prevention services. It would take it away and eliminate the protections for people with pre-existing conditions so that people with diabetes and asthma uh, and other high risk uh, illnesses for COVID-19 could be denied health insurance coverage. You have millions of people, 23 million Americans, including 6.3 million Latinos, for example, would suddenly be without health insurance during our nation's worst pandemic in our entire lifetime, uh, and especially since 1918. So this is not the time to repeal the Affordable Care Act. In fact, this is the time to build on the Affordable Care Act, to strengthen it, to reverse the sabotage that President Trump has done and we have passed a bill in the House of Representatives uh, that has a blueprint on how to do that. That bill is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Enhancement Act. That bill would expand access to the subsidies uh, for so that more families can qualify. It would al also actually increase the subsidies so that premiums are lower. Uh, Out-of-pocket costs would be lower for American families it would require the administration to negotiate lower uh, Medicare drug prices so that the cost of medicines will be cheaper for families. And it would incentivize those states that refuse to expand Medicaid coverage so they will expand Medicaid coverage so we can have more people insured. We need to expand coverage, not eliminate coverage for the American people. So this is the time that we need to really focus on the science, the evidence that will help us do two things. One is to immediately address the pandemic and two, in parallel track, help us expand and alleviate the healthcare disparities through this, through this failed uh, healthcare system. Uh, so that we can build upon that for long-term fixes. And I'm glad the president-elect uh, Biden and vice president-elect Harris administration has that plan to uh, introduce a, a public option uh, and, uh, and to do the things that we have uh, spoken already about. Uh, but if we don't win the Senate, that uh, effort is going to be tougher uh, for us to do. Not impossible, but definitely more difficult. And with that, I just want to say thank you for hosting uh, this panel. I look forward to the conversation, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congressman Ruiz. I'd now like to welcome Congresswoman Robin Kelly from Illinois' 2nd District. Congressman Kelly, welcome, and tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on this important topic. Thank you, Maria, and I just want to thank the CEI CHCI for inviting me. And of course, I'm honored to be with my two esteemed uh, colleagues from the House of Representatives. But my name is Robin Kelly. I represent the second congressional district of Illinois in the Chicagoland area, kind of unique because it's urban, suburban, and rural. So it really is a microcosm. Uh, in my At the end of my freshman year, I was asked to chair the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust. I never thought health would uh, be uh, such a big part of my portfolio, but serving as a chair and really learning more and more and more about the disparities that my colleague just talked about has made me more determined to do everything I can to eliminate the disparities or at least see them decrease. And I think we have a great chance under our newly elected uh, president and vice president. As my colleague said, we need to build upon the ACA, uh, not get rid of it. When the bill passed, uh, I don't think anyone thought that it was a perfect bill, but it was a great start. And now 23 million people um, have health insurance and then more people can uh, leave their children on until 26. Uh, pre-existing conditions are not uh, 
they don't prevent you from having health care, and then the lifetime cap. So if we lost that, it would affect even more than the 23 million people. In my opinion, health care is a human right, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that everyone has a uh, a quality level of health care. And we see uh, from the disparities that communities of color um, suffer more. Um, COVID-19 has really shown a bright light on that. They're shocking numbers, but not surprising to any of us that have studied this issue, looked at this issue, lived uh, this issue. This has been going on uh, forever. And uh, we really need to look at the social determinants of health, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the food deserts, the the poverty, uh, access to healthcare, access uh, to mental health, and on and on and on, education, all the things that determine your life. There is a section of Chicago, and either you, if you go south to north, your life expectancy decreases as much as 30 years. If you go north to south, it increases 30 years. And that is in a seven mile radius. That is absolutely ridiculous. So uh, we need to get a better healthcare system uh, for all people in the United States. And I look forward to the conversation and uh, I have hope that uh, as we enter the 117th Congress, we'll truly be able to do something about this. So thank you so much. Terrific, thank you so much, Congresswoman Kelly. We look forward to the conversation. And now I'd like to welcome Congressman Ami Barra from California's 7th District. Congressman Barra, what are your thoughts about what we're going through today and the importance of the ACA? Well, first off, Maria, thank you and, and CHCI. And it's wonderful being on with my colleagues from the Tri-Caucus, um, Congressman Ruiz and um, Congresswoman Kelly. Um, I'll associate myself with their remarks and, you know, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And within the ACA and within the fact that we're in this pandemic, um, yeah. it's exposed, uh, as was previously said, what we always knew was there with regards to healthcare disparities and, and fewer resources in communities of color, including um, the, the Latinx community. As we work with the, the Biden-Harris administration to defeat this virus, let's just not rebuild what we had before, but let's actually address these inequities um, in, in access. Let's build a public health workforce that will not only help us uh, address um, the, the virus, COVID-19, but also then will help address these disparities moving forward because we know, you know public health community clinics and, and, and the like have always been underfunded. And for many communities of color, including the Latinx, community, they can provide much more culturally appropriate care um, and, you know, are, are, are the place where people go to, to get utilization. And um, Congresswoman Kelly touched on it a little bit, but let's have a broad definition of, of healthcare, which also will include the economic inequities that are really being exposed by the, this pandemic. Um, you know, that that is the secondary effects of the pandemic in terms of the despair, in terms of the, the economic insecurity, the housing insecurity, the food insecurity that people are um, feeling right now, we've got to address that as well. And then, you know, so we've got to strengthen the Affordable Care Act and, and certainly protect it. But I think the pandemic does give us a, an opportunity to have a broader conversation over a whole host of issues and inequities that, that we see in, in our community. And I think that's certainly, um, something that the tri caucus talks about but i think with the, the biden administration if we rebuild as he says let's build back better let's build back better mm -hmm. and address these inequities terrific thank you, thank you so much congressman vera you all did a great job of framing the conversation and really establishing why it is so critical that we talk about this and continue to talk about this at this moment in time you talked about a global pandemic that has ravaged minority communities. Uh, we are about to surpass 240,000 Americans dying from it. Uh, the Trump administration not having been able or frankly even interested in trying to figure out how to crush the virus. And that we look forward to working with the Biden-Harris administration who have put this front and center and frankly, I think was a big reason why they got elected by the American people. I'd love to ask all three of you, uh, what 
you see, what you hear from your own constituents. We know that the Affordable Care Act has had some challenges in the past in terms of the American people full on supporting it. Right now, we are at a high of 55% of the American people supporting it. Uh, but there are still a lot of people out there, thanks to what Republicans have been saying about wanting to get rid of it, where they don't believe that it is actually going to be helpful for them, whether they think it's too expensive or it doesn't give them what they need. Uh, Congressman Ruiz, as a doctor, you must hear about this all the time. What are your constituents telling you about the Affordable Care Act? Well, those that work in the healthcare profession, like I did in the emergency department, are are very pleased with affordable because the number of uninsured patients went down. Uh, and that is definitely a very helpful for the emergency departments, the healthcare system, because uh, obviously they, 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 uh, it's easier for them to, to be able to make their ends meet, to be able to take care of other patients. Um, there's, it, it, there's twofold. One is, you know, you have a very large segment of population that for the first time have health insurance. And they know that if it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act, they would not have health insurance. Uh, but there are others who are facing, especially the middle class, who do not qualify for subsidies, uh, they are uh, inundated with higher premiums, uh, and the insurance companies are really taking advantage of these uh, moments, increasing premiums, increasing deductibles, increasing copays. So that is a problem that we need to address. One, not only in expanding the amount of middle class families who can qualify for the subsidies, but also give the subsidies, but also really put a hold or oversight on the insurance companies that are making record profits uh, during uh, during these uh, these difficult days. So so it's uh, it's important that we make sure people continue to have their protections in the health insurance plan. Um, but it's we also have to look at lowering the cost of medication, lowering the out-of-pocket costs for deductibles and co-pays through the exchange. And we're now, through the pandemic, seeing a really steep rise in the amount of people that are enrolling in Medicaid and that are also enrolling in the healthcare exchange during this pandemic, unfortunately, because they're losing their employer-based uh, health insurance, but it's working as a safety net for these individuals as well. Congresswoman Kelly, what are you hearing from your constituents and how do you think that we can move forward if the Affordable Care Act survives the Supreme Court? There are going to be people that are going to say that it needs to be changed. We know that there are some changes that we want to make for the better. Do you think that we will be able to work in a bipartisan manner to get to a better health care system for the whole country? Well, first of all, I hear um, from my constituents that the complaint is that it's still too expensive, the deductible. Mm -hmm. And then who I really hear from are my small businesses, that it's so uh, tough on them. I, I hear from them a lot. Um, you know, I'm an optimist, so I want to think that we can move forward and make improvements. Um, I'm hoping that because Joe Biden served in the Senate so many years and he has the relationships that he has, that some of them have softened up, <laughs> has softened <laughs> up some, and they will listen that Mitch McConnell won't be um, the Grim Reaper, as he called himself, mm -hmm. and he will be open because so many people now, when you think about COVID, are going to have pre existing conditions. I mean, the two doctors are on either side of me, so they could address that more, but um, there will be more people with pre-existing conditions, more people registering for uh, the Affordable Care Act because they have lost their job. But I'm hoping that we can find a way to lower, you know, start at least by lowering prescription drug costs. And um, mm -hmm. I know Dr. Ruiz and I have talked a lot about surprise billing, which supposedly both sides, because his bill was bipartisan, are interested mm -hmm. in dealing with that. So maybe if we deal with um, what is bipartisan in thought first, then we can, you know, build, keep building relations and move to the stickier parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the difficult part, right? But we got to stick to it. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Kelly. Congressman Barra, uh, what are you hearing from your constituents? And 
How do you see this working? Congresswoman Kelly laid out some of the difficulties, the, so the co-pays, the small businesses. We've always heard that there are issues there. Do you think that there's a way that we can get to agreement with a Republican Congress? Um, yes, but the, the first step is there's two special elections in Georgia on January 5th. If we can win those special elections, we will have a narrow Democratic majority in the Senate and right. it'll make it a lot easier for us to, to, to work on some of the issues that we want to work on. Outside of that, though, I think there probably are places that, that we can work on, but it remains to be seen what the post-Trump Republican Party looks like. Is it is Mitch McConnell, if he remains Senate Majority Leader, going to continue to take an obstructionist approach? Or can we move beyond health care being the political wedge issue and really agree with what most Americans, Democrats and Republicans, already know? They're paying more. They're getting less access is, is, is really difficult and there's real issues that are nonpartisan issues like the cost of prescription drugs and, and, mm -hmm. and the like. Um, the Affordable Care Act is built on a lot of conservative principles actually. And you know, I think President Obama a decade ago really tried to craft a solution that could get bipartisan support. Obviously it didn't happen at, at that point, but I think there are ways and, and pieces of legislation that are already out there that we could address. Robin um, and Dr. Ruiz led on surprise medical billing, but we've also, I don't think the individual mandate is gonna come back. I think that's too political of an issue, but we've got a bill on um, auto enrollment that you know the default should be if you don't sign up and you qualify for subsidies, you automatically get enrolled because there's a, a ton of folks that actually would pay very little or nothing to get their health care. They're just not signing up and that's a step in the right direction. We're also seeing at the state level, when the public is given a chance to vote on Medicaid expansion, they actually are voting to push their states to expand into Medicaid. We're now down to only 12 of the states that haven't done Medicaid expansion. Recently, Missouri voters um, voted to expand Medicaid. So. You know, there, there's areas that I think we can have some leverage. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, at a time where um, Congressman Ruiz rightly said, there's so many people that qualify for, for Medicaid right now that have lost their um, private insurance coverage at a time when state budgets are really strapped and they need a bailout. We've got a little bit of leverage. You know, one way, if we're going to bail them out, I'd like to bail them out and encourage them to do the right thing. and and. You know, so, you know, are those conversations that we can have as we do some state and local funding relief, um, perhaps to push people in the right direction to get expansion? Great. Thank you, Congressman Barra. Let's talk a little bit about what's at stake. Congressman, you mentioned the two special elections in Georgia, and you're right, that will at least give Democrats a chance to have some leverage with Vice President Harris being the tiebreaker if we win both of those seats. So I think one of the things that we should talk about is what is at stake if the Affordable Care Act gets struck down by the Supreme Court? We don't know what they're going to do. Oral arguments have been presented before them just in, in the last uh, several days. So we have no indication one way or the other. So let's talk about, let's start talking to all of our constituencies about what will happen if the Affordable Care Act gets struck down. What will happen to the nation's health care system and to the lives of the tens of millions of Americans who depended on this? Uh, let me start with you, Congressman Ruiz. It will be catastrophic and chaotic. I think those are the two words that can best describe it because suddenly those that were able to have health insurance for the first time because of the ACA would no longer have health insurance. Those that were relying on the subsidies in order to afford their health insurance uh, would no longer have those subsidies. Suddenly those who have diabetes, uh, HIV, asthma, and other chronic illness uh, could be at the whim of their insurance company to either deny them when open enrollment comes or to be charged more money uh, or to have the services they need 
cost more or be denied those specific services. Uh, the cost of medications for seniors will go up because the donut hole coverage uh, be, will once again have a... So that's the problem and the reality. The chaotic portion of this is that you'll have states, you'll have families, you'll have governments trying to figure out how in the middle of a pandemic to address this enormous problem. Of course, Congress would have to act quickly uh, with a Biden administration, we would be able to take the uh, framework of the Affordable Care Act, make some adjustments, add on the strengthening uh, provisions from the recently passed health bill plus the public option with the Affordable Care Act. But that would need to happen quickly and the American people will need to voice their concerns to Congress as well as the Senate, especially uh, Mitch McConnell, so that we can get something uh, through right away. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Congresswoman Kelly, we just went through a historic election where we asked everyone to make sure to have their voices heard. This is an indication that that privilege and or responsibility never ends because it is only through the voices of our constituents that their leaders are going to understand what they need and want. Republicans keep talking about how they have a plan that they will protect Americans with pre-existing conditions. Is that at all credible? And what's our response to that? Well, if they have a plan, I haven't seen it. And I don't think my <laughs> colleagues have seen it either. And at one point of us being in Congress, all of us were under a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate. So if they had a plan, that would have been the time to, uh, they wouldn't even have to show it to us. They could just pass it because they had enough members and they had the president to sign it into law. But I don't think we've seen that plan yet. So I really don't think they have a plan. I, frankly, I think they just wanted to give uh, President Obama a very, very hard time, first and foremost. But then when they had the opportunity to put a plan forward, uh, they didn't do it. And then thank goodness for um, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, and the late Senator McCain, uh, when it came up in the Senate uh, to do away with the ACA, that didn't happen either. So no, I don't think they have a plan. I just think they wanted to complain so much about, uh, uh, you know, what we had, but they could have made improvements, you know, uh, or they had ideas and suggestions and things like that. But to my knowledge, I have not heard uh, any suggestions. It's just, let's do away with it, you know, just throw it out the window. So, um, you know, uh, it's a lot of talk, a lot of drama, but no plan. So let's stay on this, Congressman Barra. So what would it mean? They don't have a plan. If the Supreme Court throws it out, what will the senior citizens do? The disabled Americans who are enrolled in the program, how are they going to be impacted? The parents who have their children on their plans, because we know they can keep them on their plans until they're 26 years old. It sounds like it would be pandemonium. It absolutely would be pandemonium. And it wouldn't just take us back to 2009 when they passed the Affordable Care Act. It would take us much further back and would not just impact people who are getting care under the Affordable Care Act. It would disrupt the whole healthcare delivery system because so many changes have been made in how we provide coverage, how we fund coverage and, 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 and deliver that care that it would really undermine um, the financial foundations of um, the healthcare delivery system. In addition, you know, if you just think about um, how divided we are as a nation, I feel fairly confident that um, my state, Raul State, um, California, would figure out how can we continue to provide coverage and keep people intact. But a lot of red states that didn't lean into the Affordable Care Act don't provide that coverage. Um, those folks are, are you know, facing economic hardship right now, are facing the worst of the, the pandemic. I think they go backwards again. And you know, I think we're generous as, as Californians and, and certainly Illinois is the same way where we realize we're trying to do the right thing and get folks coverage and address these issues. But we also know we're the United States of America. We're all part of the same country. So we want to address those issues in states um, that aren't quite so generous. Um, and I think it would just set them back 
further back. Right. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the Supreme Court and what are the expectations there. Uh, the Supreme Court heard arguments on November 10th. There seemed to have been some commentary about how Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, and uh, even the new Justice Amy Comey Barrett seemed reluctant to agree with the Solicitor General who was arguing on behalf of the current administration, Donald Trump administration, that the law should be kicked out or completely repealed simply because the individual mandate no longer existed. Now, of course, we can never really, you know, figure out or decipher what that means one way or the other. So let's talk about what will happen or what do you guys expect the Supreme Court to do? And how are House Democrats preparing for the outcome? Uh, Congressman Reese, we'll start with you. Well, um, I believe power of positive, so I'm going to say that they will rule in uh, in our favor and not strike down the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and I'm just going to throw it out there, and I'm going to hope and expect that that happens, so that we don't have to face the worst case scenario of repealing. And it really is. You couldn't even you can't even devise a worse case scenario than repealing the ACA during this pandemic. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. But nonetheless, I'm going to put it out to the universe, I'll include it in my prayers. Uh, and, and, and if the worst case scenario happens, then I, I'm pretty sure that the House will act quickly and swiftly with the Biden administration to introduce a bill uh, or at least and give flexibility to states to quickly accommodate uh, the challenges that they will soon have. But with the positive thought that they will rule in our favor. Let's let's hope so. If that doesn't happen, Congresswoman Kelly, what do you think House Democrats should be preparing for and how? Well, first of all, well, I'm, I'm with Ruiz. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that um, if they're, if we are sworn in and they're still deliberating, I don't know how long you know, this is going to go on. I do think that we need to start putting a plan in place anyway, um, something, an alternative plan, a complementary plan, like whatever the issue is um, that these folks have against the Affordable Care Act, what can we do to... Um, supplant their issue so just in case the ruling does go against us that that we're ready uh, to put something else uh in place even if it's temporary uh i know we've talked about uh it would be chaotic and we talked about individuals but our healthcare system the cook county healthcare system one of the biggest in the united states would absolutely fall apart they have a waiver because of the aca and Oh my God! I, I mean, beside you know people not getting care, how many people would lose their jobs? Even uh, healthcare, I know for me is the second largest industry uh, after manufacturing. And the only reason I think manufacturing is bigger is because I have two Ford plants. But after that, it's the healthcare system. Right, Congressman Barra, what about you? What should House Democrats be? thinking about in terms of a possible preparation if the Supreme Court goes sideways on this? You know, we should keep practicing the power of positive thinking that Raul said. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, but should the court surprise us? And again, you know, we heard um, Justice Roberts and, and Kavanaugh's comments. Um, and I should give a shout out to our state attorney general, Javier Becerra, um, yes. for really taking the, the lead here in our solicitor general, former CHC member and, and former colleague of ours, um, who really has um, done an outstanding job as the attorney general. Um, look, I don't, I, I don't really want to think about what what that scenario looks like. Um, 
we probably have to look at the merits of why they would toss it out then and try to say, okay, is there a quick fix here that's a legislative fix mm -hmm. that we can take and, and, and move forward? Um, or, you know, because it was a real heavy lift to pass the, the Affordable Care Act the first time. So, you know, it'll, it'll be difficult, um, you know, if we're starting from scratch. I know we certainly have been talking to folks within the um, the, the Biden uh, administration or the, the future Biden administration about what a public um, option looks like. You know, could you get bipartisan support for a Medicare Advantage type option where um, you could start lowering the, the age to 60, potentially 55 and allowing folks through the exchanges to buy into Medicare like advantage? Medicare Advantage like product, I think you could build some bipartisan support. There's some loopholes that industry's taken advantage of in Medicare Advantage, but it's really popular. It's, you know, it is not Medicare for all. It allows you know, those groups and, and health systems to, that are willing to take risk to take some of that risk. And you might, you might be able to get some bipartisan support for something like that. But far and away, let's not throw out the ACA, and I hope the Supreme Court does the right thing. And then that allows us to build on those places where people are still being left out. Right. Let's hope the power of positive thinking. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what's next. Um, what should the viewers who are watching this conference, your constituents, do to learn more about this issue? Uh, Congressman Ruiz, let's start with you. Well, one, they should uh, obviously go on to uh, and do their research on the Internet uh, regarding the actual Affordable Care Act. Uh, they need to stay in tune with the news outlets to understand what's happening in the Supreme Court. Uh, definitely pay attention to C-SPAN and the bills and the way members discuss them on the House floor so you can get a good sense of what uh, the arguments are on both sides. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, this is really the time to uh, to make your voices heard. Uh, this is, it's, you know, any, we, we have millions of Americans who have been infected with COVID-19. Uh, right now, everybody is just focused on the amount of deaths, but that is such a black and white way of viewing this that doesn't really give full justice to the to the devastation that the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 has created in our country. You have 30-year-olds who are who are having strokes and myocardial infarctions due to vasculitis and increased immune system response. You have kids that are having multi-organ failures that will now have chronic illness. You have uh, uh, renal failure as a result of this. So the, it's not just about people who are dying, although that is, of course, the most extreme heartbreaking scenario, but you're having millions of people who will now have chronic illness because of this. And we don't know, yeah, is we don't know what the long-term effects of children being infected with this. We think, oh, they get infected, but they have a lower rate of getting really sick, although they can get really sick from COVID-19 as well. It's just not as frequently as adults. Uh, but we don't know if it has Zika-like properties that mm -hmm. after 10, 15 years can manifest in a Guillain-Barre or immunological disorder. We just don't know because we don't have the research. It hasn't been around that long. So, um, so we, we need to understand that, uh, that we need to be engaged in this conversation, that, that we have uh, certain immediate challenges. And a lot of people have made up their mind whether they want a specific type of health delivery system or they want to expand on the ACA or in public option. I think that if the Affordable Care Act gets repealed, uh, we're going to need a practice like an emergency physician. Uh, no offense to the internist friend of mine, uh, Ami, Dr. Ami Berra, but we're going to have to prioritize the problems and, uh, and make sure we keep a patient alive first uh, and then start working on the other, other issues that we need to work on. Congresswoman Kelly, so we're asking viewers and constituents and voters to become more engaged with this issue. That's right. That's the only way that leaders will see what their uh, constituents are thinking. And how do we 
talk to the young people. You know that young people, when they're in their 20s or their 30s, they think they're invincible, but they are one of the most important groups to make sure that they sign up for this. How do we do that? How do we ask them to become more engaged on this issue? You know, I think that it helps when we find other engaged young people. And so you have peers uh, speaking with peers. Uh, my husband and I have four. four, four they're 90 and um and just uh all of them wear masks because i'll kill them but <laughs> but my um but my uh son's wife got covid and she's very old, so we're still she's fine now we, we're not sure exactly what happened he never you know had it but i think that we need to work with um their peers that get it to to work with them because sometimes you know when uh mom or dad or someone older we're looked at as just um you know being pains or hounding or helicopter parents but also the other thing they have to realize like they're the restaurants that are now closed down uh in my area a lot of them are closed down because it's the 21 to 30 something year olds that you know went to the bars and huddled no mask uh no uh, physical distancing you know that it was a lot you know college students you know the big party still the frat and sorority party so they have to take responsibility too but i think that it would help if um we found almost like ambassadors or advocates that are close to their age that's a good idea congressman Barra. we are asking constituents again and viewers to have their voices heard to voice their opinions on the ACA you know a lot of Americans still don't quite understand what's the best way to reach people like you so can you talk to us a little bit about what's the best way to engage members of Congress on the issue of the ACA Absolutely. At the end of the day, each of us works for our constituents. They're our bosses, so they should go to each of our websites. They should call our offices, share their opinion. And, you know, as, as our late colleague John Lewis um, would tell us, you know, this is all about standing up, showing up and speaking out. And, you know, we just had, had an election recently and young people showed up. They stood up and they spoke out with their, their vote in record numbers. And we ought to be proud about that. And I, I am hopeful that this is a generation that now is going to be lifetime voters. And in our democracy, your vote is your voice. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that that's the best way to, to really express things. In the post-pandemic world, we'll all be doing town halls. Show up at those town halls and express your opinion. Or if you're in a Republican district, um, show up at those town halls and, and let them know that, you know, what the ACA means. But, you know, this is the House of Representatives. We work for the people. That's a great reminder. Thank you, Congressman. We're going to go to audience questions now. We have a handful of questions from uh, folks who have been listening and watching. So the first one, I am going to give it to you, uh, Congressman Ruiz. And it's as follows. Every health indicator is horrible in the Latino community. The ACA helped, but we urgently need a comprehensive plan to increase access to care. What can be done about this? Oh man, you're talking my favorite subject here. You know, I've, <laughs> I've been involved in, in all the Latino, Chicano student associations, medical students and association, residency associations. That's been the topic of the lifetime. Look, first of all, uh, we know that the number one barrier to access to care is costs uh, and having insurance is very helpful. And those that cannot pay for the private insurance, having an expansion of Medicaid is so very important. The, others, the other thing is we need to ensure that we have providers. And we have providers in communities that don't traditionally have providers. Where I grew up, even today, we have one full-time equivalent physician per 9,000 residents. And uh, the primarily uh, the communities that have the worst are Latino, rural, maybe farm worker communities. And so we need to ensure that we start looking comprehensively at a pipeline program so that we can get more 
uh, minority or underrepresented students into the medical profession because it's just it's just statistics that is a known fact that they tend to go and work in those underserved communities at much higher mm -hmm. rates than uh, than other communities. And then finally, we we have to invest. We have to invest in the infrastructure within our communities. So in other words, where do we get our health care? We get our health care at community health centers, at federal qualified health centers. We get our health care uh, oftentimes in the emergency department, unfortunately. But we have to beef up the safety net system and we have to invest in those uh, locations. But the other thing, Maria, look, mm -hmm. and this is what I'm really excited about that people just aren't getting. We talk about how we're going to pay for a healthcare system that is very expensive and that has produced very poor health outcomes. And right now, all of our conversation is about that. How much more subsidies? How are we going to cover an insurance to pay for this, this failed healthcare system that has produced unhealthy population at an incredible astronomical high cost? What we need to do is we need to change our perspective and move us from being the um, really only really good at keeping very sick people alive to mm -hmm. also at keeping healthy people healthy. And how are we going to do that in this pandemic and beyond? We're going to do that two ways. One is we have to focus on taking more home-based, community-based care using technology. Uh, broadband expansion, et cetera, at our households, at community centers, so that we can provide the, the more personal care for individuals in their homes or in their churches or in their school groups, et cetera. But in addition to that, we need to think out of the box and create a promotora model-like system mm -hmm. where we have health coaches, where we have community health workers that work alongside the providers using this technology to go to people's home uh, and do diet uh, education, exercise cooking, to make most complex, expensive, chronic care uh, patients who utilize mm -hmm. their 20% of the of the population utilize 80% of the services that we have a very personalized pathway uh, and protocol of care for them. Research has already demonstrated that when we do this type of care, focus on prevention and keeping healthy people healthy, then not only will they be happier because it's it's uh, done with community members and uh, and mm -hmm. paraprofessionals that are their neighbors, but they are healthier, happier, healthier, and they are less expensive in general because they're healthier. They don't go to the emergency department or land in the ICU ICU as much. That's the holy grail. So if we can envision the deliver a change in the delivery system and look at health equity in the front end and not in the back end and devise this system, especially during the pandemic, we'll have more contact tracers, we'll have more uh, public health workers, we'll have more health coaches, and we'll start focusing on keeping healthy people healthy beyond this pandemic as well. Great, that sounds like a great plan, Dr. Ruiz. Congresswoman Kelly, uh, health insurance is still tied to full-time employment in this country with 41% of Latinos in the gig economy and other minorities as well, African-Americans, AAPI, Native Americans. How can the public and private sector work together to ensure gig workers have access to affordable health care? Well, I, in general, think that we need to work toward everyone having health care. I know there's different, uh, you know, medic care for all and, you know, uh, ACA with a public option and all of that. But I think that um, everybody uh, should have uh, health care. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you I have this great plan devised because uh, I do not, but I do think, um, you know, that definitely uh, should be our goal. If, um, if it's, um, you know, paying into certain things or uh, changing um, you know, qualifications as far as what subsidies you get. Um, but I, I think that we have to work toward, you know, everyone getting a certain uh, level of health care or people will use the emergency room. People won't take care of themselves, which will end up costing more money uh, in the end. And I know I was on President Biden's um, 
he could pick four people and Sanders could pick four people. And I was one of Biden's four. And I think Dr. Ruiz was listening because what he said was he wanted more uh, community workers to go in and educate uh, the community and talk to them about lifestyle and eating and all of that. And then um, uh, so he really wants to grow um, a, not a new field, but make a field a bigger. And then also uh, we have to diversify the healthcare pipeline because people do better when it is someone that looks like them. That's been you know, proven uh, over and over. But I, I just think that we have to get to a system where everyone um, has the opportunity uh, to have healthcare. I mean, just the bottom line. Yeah. Congressman Barra, this one's for you. We have still have a lot of young people who are very progressive and who wanted and were for Medicare for all. So the question is, do you think at some point the country will be ready to implement something like Medicare for all? We know that uh, President-elect Joe Biden has talked about the public option, um, but there are a lot of young kids who still think Medicare for all is the way to go. So what do you say to them? You know, I, I'd say as Democrats, we all agree that everybody should have access to health care, that in a country like ours, if someone gets sick, um, they should be able to go see a doctor. And if they get really sick, they shouldn't have to worry about bankruptcy. I think that's a universal value of the Democratic Party. We should have robust debate on how we get there. You know, what are the, the potential vehicles um, to get there, but it would be politically very difficult to dismantle the entire healthcare delivery system and 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 you know re re um, compose it in, in a Medicare for all system because we also know Medicare has real challenges as well. It has outdated um, computer systems. It has it, it is a, a very popular program, but then if you dive deeper. Are we looking at a Medicare fee for service model, which I would say I would not want us to go into, or a Medicare Advantage type model, which I'd say um, could actually work, but there are things that we have to fix within Medicare Advantage as well. So I, I don't think we're that far apart as, as a party, because I think we have that universal value of everyone in America should if they get sick, be able to go see a doctor. And if they get really sick, they shouldn't have to worry about being bankrupt. And they should, in a c country like ours, you know, that, that we're an outlier here, that there's so many folks that are not getting it. And I would just add, you know, one, um, Raul touched on it. This isn't going to take additional money. We're already spending a ton of money on healthcare. We're just not spending it in the right places and taking care of the populations. And there's a real cost to not caring for these folks, because we're not preventing the, the heart attack. We're waiting until the heart attack happens and they still show up in the emergency room and we'll still take care of them. Um, so yeah. it's a lot more cost effective to do preventive care and address these things on the front end. Well, amigos, if you can believe it, we are about to wrap up. Uh, it went by so quickly. I'm gonna give each of you the opportunity to give one minute closing remarks. What is the most important thing for our viewers and your constituents to come away, away with from this conversation? Congressman Ruiz, you first. The most important thing is to wear your mask, stay socially <laughs> distanced by six feet, do not congregate. We are in the middle of a very terrible pandemic. The numbers are rising. Please, please do your part knowing that it's our communities that are devastated and most vulnerable to dying from this COVID-19. Uh, the other thing is knowing that the tug and and war and, and defending the provisions within the Affordable Care Act, people, protections for pre-existing condition, the Medicaid expansion, uh, and uh, the essential health benefit, that has, th this is one of the disparities or the disproportions that I actually like, Maria, because that has helped Latinos, African Americans, Native Americans, and rural underserved communities more than other populations. We have benefited greatly from the 
provisions within the Affordable Care Act. So we need to make sure that we defend it and build on it to make it better for everybody. Then finally, Maria, I just want to say it's so good to see you again. It's It's been a while. <laughs> uh, I truly love this this conversation and you know you couldn't have picked a, such an all-star panel with uh congresswoman robin kelly mm -hmm. the healthcare task force chair brain trust leader and cbc and we sit on <laughs> energy and commerce together she's always <laughs> asking the right and tough questions and then dr Bear, uh, it, also a Californian who's leading the way in a strong uh, healthcare policy uh, uh, voice here. And I'm just so proud of CHCI to continue to, to make the best of a difficult uh, situation. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Congressman Ruiz. Congresswoman Kelly. Well, ditto to everything my colleague just said, but I want people to remember that voting is your voice and voting is your superpower. So don't forget to use it, that we work for you. Uh, you don't work for us. So if you wanna learn more, if you wanna know more, if you have a question or a concern or suggestion, we don't have all the answers. Uh, please, please contact your congressperson or your senator or your state rep or state senator. Um, you know, please exercise your right to uh, voice your opinion. So thank you so much again for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And it's an honor to be uh, with my two colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Kelly. Congressman Vera. And I would just echo everything um, that my two colleagues said and add one thing to um, what Raul said. It's not too late to go get your flu shot. Get that flu shot. It's incredibly mm -hmm. important as, as we go into what could be a tough November, December, January. Um, but we will get through this and we will get through it much more easily if we come together as a, a community and a country and look after mm -hmm. one another, particularly those that we know are frontline workers that are going out there every day and, you know, in the, the Latinx community and putting themselves at risk. Um, let's care for one another you know i i am an optimist because you know that's what um president elect biden ran on bringing us together and addressing these issues they're right out in front of us right now let's not close our eyes let's actually keep our eyes open and rise to the moment and address these issues so thank you Great. Thank you so much, Congressman Vera. I really want to thank all three of you. It was such an incredible honor to be able to moderate this panel. I learned so much. I know that our viewers uh, have learned a lot and everyone who's watching this uh, really got a sense of how urgent this issue is, of how important everyone's voice is who understands that the issue of healthcare literally is an issue of life and death, especially for the Latino community, African-American community, AAPI community, the Native American community, all of the minority communities in this country who deal with disproportionate impacts from a global pandemic that has ravaged the whole country. This is an issue that is in our hands, what we do, how we speak out about it, how we speak up about it, and make sure that our voices are heard. So I would love to thank CHCI. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, everyone who has given the opportunity for this really important conversation to take place. So muchísimas gracias, cuídense mucho, and please wear a mask and get your flu shot. Muchas gracias.